Hello, my name is Pelin Oz, um, and I'd like to welcome you all to our program that we organize as uh, Istanbul Policy Center, Sabancı University and Stiftung Mankator Initiative in collaboration with Mediascope. Um, today, uh, we will be talking about um, the refugee crisis. Uh, in our earlier programs, we mainly talk about uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine from different aspects. And uh, today we have a, a migration expert with us, uh, Mr. Uh, Gerald Knaus. Uh, um, and uh, we are very fortunate and lucky to have him with us because he's very well acknowledged and very well known in this field of migration. And uh, please let me introduce him first and then we can maybe continue with our questions. Um, Gerald Knaus is um, the founding chairman of European Stability Initiative which is a think tank with offices in Berlin, Brussels and Vienna, working on Southeast Europe, the Caucasus and European enlargement and the future of uh, EU foreign policy. And he has co-authored many um, uh, reports on EU enlargement, the Balkans, Turkey and the Caucasus and uh, all of the um, reports and uh, establishments that he has made triggered a wide range of debates and he is very influential in policy circles um, uh, within the policymakers as well. He has been a fellow and founding member of many different uh, and well-known European institutions in Europe. And he also, we were very fortunate to have him also as our um, Mercator IPC senior fellow in 2016 and um, 17. So I'd like to welcome you, uh, Mr. Knaus. Thank, thank you for uh, joining us uh, in this program. Well, um, thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, it's always nice to be in touch with Istanbul. Thank you very much. Um, now we are on um, day 43 in, in uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, we tried to cover the issue from different angles. We tried to look at uh, how it has an effect on the global order and uh, on Western uh, Russian relations, including China and where Turkey stands within this conflict. We tried to talk about this. And now from a more humanitarian aspect, we would like to talk about millions fleeing Ukraine. And uh, this is now one of the biggest crises after the Second World War uh, that Europe is facing in terms of refugee crisis. So um, since we have the expert uh, on uh, such issues, now uh, we would like to talk about these issues more in depth. Maybe we can first start with Mr. Knaus, if uh, you, you can... Uh, tell us what are your takes on uh, the Russian invasion on uh, of of Ukraine in terms of uh, your interpretation of the situation and its imp implications for Europe and the Western Balkans. Yes, <clears throat> I mean, well, you said it. It's already, and it has been after only uh, three weeks, the biggest refugee crisis. Uh, that the European Union has faced in its existence. It is the biggest refugee crisis in Europe since the 1940s. And it could become, if things continue uh, like they have the last six weeks, uh, the biggest refugee crisis in the world uh, in many, many, many decades. We, what we see is the result of a political decision. There would be not a single refugee if there would not have been the decision by the Kremlin, Vladimir Putin, to attack Ukraine, to attack it from all sides and to wage this war in the same way in which he waged his wars, and he has waged many, uh, in Chechnya in 2000, uh, in the Donbas, so in eastern Ukraine, since 2014, um, and of course his support for Assad in Syria, uh, which always involved massive displacement, uh, war crimes, the bombing and destruction of civilian infrastructure, uh, of schools, of uh, theaters, of hospitals, and uh, terror as a way of waging war. So the executions that we've seen, the war crimes that we've seen near to Kiev uh, in, in recent days that have shocked the world uh, are not really surprising in any way. Tens of thousands of people were killed or disappeared in Chechnya when Vladimir Putin had just become president. And the destruction of the city of Mariupol, I mean, a city as big as Edirne, you know, 430,000 people, 
uh, in only a few weeks, a complete destruction of the city. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we are going to learn about even more massive war crimes committed there. So it's a humanitarian catastrophe uh, and it's only beginning. It, I, I fear that we are very far from an end to this war. And the tragedy is even uh, getting deeper and deeper as the longevity of the war uh, continues. Um, when we think about European response on this um, uh, civilians fleeing Ukraine, the refugees fleeing Ukraine, how do you evaluate that? Maybe we can start by Poland, because Poland is one of the biggest uh, hosting uh, country, now becoming the second country after Turkey. Uh, so what, what is your take on uh, Poland's uh, reaction towards the refugees at the moment? Well, I, I think it's really interesting to look at the European response. Um, what worked well and why and, and what is not working well. Now, what worked extremely well was the first reaction by EU interior ministers, the council, all 27 together deciding very early on that all Ukrainian refugees, all Ukrainian citizens, everyone who is a resident in Ukraine, this includes Russians who are married to Ukrainians, all foreign students who studied in Ukraine, um, all asylum seekers in Ukraine. So basically anybody who had any legal status or irregular status in Ukraine on the eve of the war had the right to enter the European Union and had the right, in the case of Ukrainians, uh, and most of these categories to apply and receive automatically temporary protection. Now, that means that in a country of more than 40 million people, uh, anybody who feels that it's unsafe given the nature of the war can go to the European Union, can go anywhere in the European Union, any country can travel freely and can apply for a residence, a temporary residence, which involves social support, the right to work immediately, the right to put children to school. So this is the most generous response to a mass flight of refugees that you have seen. Why did Europe do that? One reason is that the, the images of the war were immediately shown in every European living room. Uh, citizens from Portugal to Finland, from Ireland to Moldova, were moved in the same way. They saw this aggression. But secondly, and this is hugely important, because Ukrainians already had visa-free travel, right? So no Ukrainian had to come into Europe irregularly. Nobody needed a smuggler. Just like Turkey had its borders open for Syrians for many years after 2011, the EU had its borders already open for Ukrainians. So in a way, the choice was to allow all of the Ukrainians to stay or to close the border, which not a single government suggested. Nobody suggested that. Uh, so this response was good. This means that now the whole European Union is open to receive uh, Ukrainian refugees, and it's mainly women and children, 80% of the refugees who are coming are women and children, men between the ages of 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave Ukraine. But, and, and, and now I come to the but, that's not enough. The decision to allow people to enter is great. But if you do not organize now uh, how you will keep up the promise of a, a roof over the head and a school for every child, given that already there are close to 4 million refugees in just six weeks, and that you must expect millions more, the idea that countries like Poland, Slovakia, uh, Moldova, the poorest country in Europe, alone uh, will be able to find accommodation is a fantasy. Now, as I said, any Ukrainian who arrives in Warsaw now, where there are 300,000 people in a city of 1.7 million, so 17%, which is, uh, you know, in, in just a few weeks. Any Ukrainian who arrives in Warsaw, of course, can go on if there is no place in Warsaw by train to Germany. And more and more are doing this. So we don't know how many of the more than 2 million who went to Poland are still in Poland. But it is clear that very soon, if another 2 million Ukrainians, which we must expect 
arrive in Europe in the next few weeks, these next two million, uh, they will not be able to stay in the neighboring countries. So you then need to organize, uh, I, I, my colleagues and I called for an airlift. You know, you need to organize distribution uh, to other countries where there is a willingness and space to provide schools, to provide houses, to provide accommodation uh, from Portugal to Ireland, to the United Kingdom, to France, where at the moment there are still uh, relatively few Ukrainian refugees. So, yes, within your um, uh, example that you're giving, uh, your offer uh, of this airlift, how would that work? Because uh, now then it would be a, a type of an equal uh, burden sharing in terms of refugees when, when it is compared uh, to the neighboring countries, not only in the, the neighboring countries, um, they're not going to be able to continue doing this, as you're saying, as more people uh, continue arriving in those areas. So we need more uh, countries getting involved with uh, the refugee crisis at hand. So you're offering an airlift solution, but how, how is that yes. going to work? Can you explain this? I mean, that's the key question. Uh, I, we proposed this airlift. Uh, I started speaking about it in the German media, on television and talk shows, and I wrote an article. And within a very short period of time, surprisingly short, leading German politicians said, first, we, we need to do that. The foreign minister, the interior minister, uh, people in parliament. And then Germany was pushing for this in the context of both the European Union and in the context of the G7 industrial nations saying, listen, we need support. So this happened very quickly. This already uh, three weeks ago. And then uh, to begin this airlift, some countries said, OK, why don't we help Moldova? Moldova is poor, the poorest in Europe with two and a half million people and has 100,000 refugees. Let's organize so that we bring people, Ukrainians from Moldova to our countries. Uh, it's a great idea. 15,000 places were offered by eight countries, seven EU countries plus Norway. And then it all fell apart. Because if you want to organize this, I mean, it's common sense, right? I, I mean, if I'm a Ukrainian mother with two children and I arrive from Odessa or from Mariupol or from Kharkiv in Moldova, and then somebody says, listen, um, you can get on the plane, we take you to Spain, and then I, I might ask, Spain, I've never, I, I mean, I don't know Spain. I've never been to the European Union. What is going to happen to me in Spain? And you, doubt, you can't answer the question. You will not have many people who get into a plane to Spain. So you need to organize information. I mean, everybody has the right to go anywhere in Europe. Uh, but these are not, refugees are not parcels. I mean, Turkey knows this. You can't just tell people you need to stay here or there I mean, if people don't know anyone, have no connections, it's very difficult to force them to go or stay anywhere. So what you need to do, what happened then with Moldova, and then, of course, it was there was no special uh, organization to organize the information and the transfers. Um, so it was given to the UNHCR. The result is that in the first few weeks, uh, very few people were flown out of Moldova to the extent that some of the countries that offered it were told, we don't need your offer right now because we can't find anyone. Now, this is crazy because at the same time, I am getting all the stories all the time from Ukrainians. You know, yesterday, a, a, a mother, her grandmother, I mean, her mother, so her mother, a grandmother and, and the child. The grandmother has cancer. They arrive in a train in Warsaw. They get out of the train station and they don't know why, where to go. So this is happening by the hundreds of thousands. And of the Moldovan, of the refugees in Moldova, of this, these hundred thousand, uh, 90, more than 90% are in private accommodation. So people open their houses, open their apartments. This is difficult to sustain. You know, energy prices are exploding in Moldova. It's completely dependent on Russian energy. It's a poor country already. The, trend, the exports through Odessa and the Black Sea are cut off. Uh, now you have all these refugees. So it's clear you need to help Moldova, but you need to organize this. And that's why, you know, the idea of distributing refugees to countries that are willing to receive them will only work if you approach it 
as a massive, and this requires organized humanitarian operation. So you need to find countries or cities or regions in Europe that say we have the ability to house people. You know, in the United Kingdom, 200,000 households said and registered to house a Ukrainian. I I'm sure you can find something similar in Sweden, in Finland, uh, in Ireland, in, in, in Portugal, in Spain. People who say, the muni municipalities, cities who say we house people, and then you need to get people, ideally, who already live there from the Ukrainian diaspora to explain to the Ukrainians when they arrive in the European Union or in Moldova, why it makes sense for them to quickly go to Spain or, or Finland, because it will be easier for their children to go to school and for them to have a house and find a job. Because if everyone is in Warsaw or in Krakow or in Poland, uh, Poland is not going to be able to cope. That's clear. And this organization, at the moment, we don't have. I mean, there is no effort. The European Commission, at the moment, still believes the distribution of the next two million will happen like the last four million by itself. And that's dangerous. Uh, so, actually, diaspora plays a great, quite important role in those countries who are going to be able to receive these uh, refugees. But when we think about Poland, uh, the Polish authorities were saying that they don't they're not really interested in this uh, relocation of uh, refugees, but they're interested in more financial support in order to ease this burden uh, over uh, Polish authorities, because um, they're thinking that this is going to be a temporary uh, situation and most of the refugees who are now in Poland are going to be back to Ukraine somehow uh, because they want to unite their families uh, and they don't want to go further away from uh, a possibility going back to their home. Um, so uh, what what would you think about this? Uh, what could be the challenges of relocation? Well, there, there, are, there, are, there are a number of things in, in what you said. Uh, first, the, the, it's true that the Polish government um, is interested in financial support for the refugees. And I very much believe this is in the interests of everyone in Europe. We, we urgently, I mean, my colleagues and I are, are calling for the creation of a special fund uh, that would give municipalities, you know, local governments, cities that house refugees, where refugees are registered, for each refugee for a year, 5,000 euros. Uh, you know, that, that is based on the commission has such a scheme for resettlement. Uh, and in this case, it would be for accepting Ukrainian refugees. And that would mean that a municipality, which of course has a lot of extra costs uh, for kindergarten, for infrastructure, for schools, for teachers, um, isn't left alone. And you can, you should make this a European effort of solidarity. Now, uh, this, may, this, I mean, if you have 5 million refugees, which we could have very easily, very soon, and you give 5,000 euros per refugee to local governments, that's 25 billion euros. Um, but that's look that's uh, that's uh, well invested money because it's also true that the polish government is against relocation for ideological reasons they never liked relocation and this is a government that was campaigning against the eu you know this is not a very pro eu government um and what they are also saying is if people want to leave well they can just leave we will not organize it uh, now that's a bit tricky because that just means that anybody who arrives in poland and most people in Poland are not, are, yeah, they are not staying in government accommodation. They are staying privately with friends, mm -hmm. with relatives, with poles, with, with hotels. Uh, a lot of them will not be able to stay where they are now. So oh. you then need to, yeah, I mean, hotels, uh, the tourist season will start. They will say, listen, this is all very well. We've accommodated people for a few weeks. We can't, we, we need to get back to do our, our job. A private individuals, you know, if they're not relatives, they will say, we can do this for four weeks, eight weeks, three months, five months. Uh, but in the end, what's, what's the perspective? Now, it's great what Poland has done. It's fantastic. But we must expect that as this, this number is already huge, any further arrivals will discover that there is no place for them in Poland. And then, well, if Poland, if the government doesn't want to organize um, taking people from Poland to other countries, no problem. You can do that from Germany. I mean, if people get by train from Warsaw to
to uh, Berlin or Hanover or Cottbus, you know, there are some uh, hubs already. You can then work with the Finnish or British or Irish government to have exactly this information, including information from Ukrainians who live in those countries for those who arrive. And Germany is distributing already people throughout Germany. Distribution, it must be said, is always voluntary. Nobody is forced to go anywhere, right? But you should do that. And if Poland doesn't want to do it from Warsaw, you should do it from Germany. And let me tell you that Polish local authorities, the mayors of these cities, are urging other cities to do that. They are, you know, the mayor of Warsaw has said, please, please bring people from here by bus, take them because we are, you know, we cannot cope. So it's also a little bit of a difference between what the local governments in Poland say, what the central government says. Uh, never mind the politics. It is clear that for if another, you know, I've said four weeks ago that we should expect 10 million refugees if this war continues. Now we already have 4 million refugees in just <laughs> five weeks. And we have more than 6 million internally displaced inside Ukraine. Uh, now we are hearing the Ukrainian government yesterday called on people to flee from the east, where Russia is now starting a new offensive. So the soldiers will fight, but civilians should flee because everybody has seen what happens to civilians if Russian troops occupy a city. Uh, then there are still more than 100,000 people trapped in Mariupol. There will be new fighting in Kharkiv, the second biggest city. So we must expect that more millions will come. And that requires preparation. Europe has done the right thing on the law. It is great that there is so much empathy. This is a chance to show to its own citizens, most importantly to show to the Ukrainians, and a little bit to show to the rest of the world that if you have the will, you can cope even with a very large number of refugees. And of course, the one country that has shown that before is Turkey. I mean, Turkey has shown that it had its borders open for Syrians for many years. It, it has now uh, three, what is it, 3.6 million Syrians in the country. Um, you know, it's possible. It's hard. And after a while, the politics changes and there will be people who will say, listen, this is too much. And when are they going home? Um, and there will be less of this politics against refugees if it is well organized and if the integration works quickly. And the great thing about the Ukrainians coming to Europe is they can work from the first day. You know, they immediately have the right to work. So if you provide space in schools or kindergartens for the children, Many of the women who come to Europe now, uh, I mean, they've worked before. And there is a labor market in many European countries where there are jobs. And it is to be hoped that many of them will actually find the ability to stand on their own feet, which, of course, is fantastic for their integration, because then they can rent an apartment on the, lab on the housing market. And they will not, and we should avoid anything that leads a lot of people to end up in mass accommodation. Yes, actually, you answered most of the things that I wanted to ask you next. What what could be the difference of this Ukrainian refugee crisis than the crisis of uh, uh, that Europe has faced in 2015 uh, with the Syrians? How how is that different? And uh, you actually explained uh, a part of it, but if you want to uh, add more on that, uh, you may. Well, I, I mean, there are three three big differences. Um, the first one is that the Ukrainians flee to the European Union, and there is no other place to which they can flee. I mean, they, they, Ukraine has a border with Poland. Um, okay, Moldova is not in the EU, but Moldova is small, and people immediately reach Romania, Slovakia. They either reach the European Union or they stay in Ukraine. So in a way, Europe is in a similar position to Turkey with the Syrians. It's different. For Europe, in 2015, most of the Syrians who reached Europe had, of course, been in Turkey or Lebanon before. And so the argument in Europe for, for some politically was, well, they are safe in Turkey. Why is everybody coming to Europe? Which is why we recommended, my colleagues and I at the time, well, one needs to organize this. We re recommended an airlift from Turkey. We said, instead of having people cross by boat and a lot of people drowning, you know, organize this stop or try to stop the irregular migration, but bring a few hundred thousand people 
directly from Turkey to Europe to help and help with money. You know, the two common resettlement plus support. But for many Europeans in 2015, um, some countries took a lot of Syrian refugees, Germany, Sweden, Austria, but some countries there was almost no Syrian refugee or very few. Um, but the biggest difference, of course, also for Europeans is the numbers. In, in one year, we had a million people arrive in Greece from Turkey. Uh, in this crisis, we had a million people arrive in the first week. So the numbers also make a difference. But the th third big difference, of course, is that because Ukrainians already had visa-free travel, nobody ever had to make a political decision to open the border. Uh, and that's, again, it's like Turkey. Syrians could travel to Turkey before the war. So the question in Turkey was, when does Turkey close its border to Syrians? Which it did many years later. But for many years, Turkey didn't close the border. And it's the same in Europe. These are many differences. I, I think it, what this shows is I think that it's always going to be the neighbors of a conflict that are going to be the most effective. You know, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, with Syria, now the Europeans. These neighbors always need support from others. Uh, you know, it's useful if Canada offers to bring people from the European Union to Canada. It's useful if the United States offers. But most people will, for the same reason you mentioned, want to stay close to their country. You know, these Ukrainian women, their husbands, their fathers, their, their, you know, the men in the family are in Ukraine. They don't want to emigrate now to Canada. You know, that's, it's not what they think. They, as you said, they think that they could go hopefully back home while members of their family are fighting for their country. But realistically, I think if this war continues, we will see a moment in a few months time when, when it's becoming clear that there are some people who will not be able to go home, especially to territories controlled by Russia. And then offers from Canada or the US for, for resettlement become meaningful. But until that moment, the Europeans need to cope. They can. Turkey coped, but, uh, but they better get organized. Yes, maybe we can talk about also Turkey uh, in a bit. But I want to ask you one last question about the Western uh, perspective, because now West, uh, especially the European Union, has been criticized uh, of, uh, of its reactions towards uh, the warm welcoming of the Ukrainian uh, refugees, whereas in the northern part of that a little bit northern uh, of that border, uh, in the Belarusian border, uh, we have seen a great tragedy uh, just a few weeks before, uh, where the pushbacks and uh, many things that uh, made us sad has occurred. And as, at the same time, um, the, the policies of EU's externalization uh, towards refugees also is playing a great role uh, within the borders of EU, like in Belarus, also in the eastern border of Turkey, uh, for um, the Afghan and the other uh, refugees who are trying to arrive uh, from different uh, ways. What is your take on this? Well, so the first thing is that what we have seen at Belarus uh, in 2021, when uh, Lukashenko was trying to trick people to come to Belarus. You know, they paid thousands of euros to come. This was not uh, a natural migration route. Uh, his state helped people to come from, particularly from Iraq, not only, but many from Iraq. Uh, and, and his idea was to try to create pressure on the European, uh, on, on Poland in particular, on the Baltic states. Uh, he succeeded because their reaction was first uh, panic and then violent. Uh, and as you said, what the European Union is doing at that border is a clear violation of its own laws. You know, you're not allowed to push people back into a cold forest, which we've seen all winter. Uh, you know, men, women, even children. This, this violates the EU's law on the border. I mean, the Schengen Border Codex, which is the law on the borders. It violates the Refugee Convention, the... the Convention on the Rights of the Child. You know, there is no shortage of violations of human rights. And this has happened because the view in many European countries was that this is an attempt to put pressure on them 
through migration. So they didn't see the migrants. Uh, they also, you know, it is different to think of Iraqis who pay thousands of euros who are not in need of protection. You know, they, they take a normal flight with a travel agency. So the question for me was always, how do you stop that without violence? But, but stopping it is legitimate. You know, you should have found a way to stop people going to Belarus. And the only way you can stop it is if people who go through Belarus to Europe uh, don't stay in the European Union. But if you want to do that without the violence, then the only way you can do that is by what you call externalization, finding another partner and saying, listen, those who arrive who do not need protection, and Iraqis from northern Iraq do not need protection in most cases, will not stay in Europe. We will move them back to another country not in order to uh, create problems for the other country, but to stop the, the whole movement. But this was not done. What we have instead is violence. And this is not the only border where we see this. We have violence on the border uh, between Hungary and uh, Serbia, between Croatia and Bosnia, uh, on the borders of the EU with Turkey. We have people being pushed back in the Aegean in large numbers. All of which, let's just be very, I mean, it's very clear, all of which is against the EU's laws and against international law. But for all of which you need a solution that, and that's what, I mean, I wrote this book in German, uh, which borders do we need between fear and empathy on the future of asylum? Uh, and what I say there is it is legitimate to try to stop irregular migration. Only you cannot do it with violence and you should then open legal routes. For migrants, it's something different than for refugees. Refugees, it's resettlement. And for migrants, it's offering either visa liberalization uh, or work schemes or, you know. Now, is the European Union discriminating against others compared to Ukrainians? That is more tricky because... The Ukrainians are rightly seen as in need of protection. You know, these are women and children fleeing while the men go the other way. 200,000 Ukrainians went from the EU to Ukraine to fight, while the, mainly the women, children and the elderly came to the European Union. Everyone in Europe can see very immediately that they need protection. So if you get protection in Europe as a refugee, you have the same rights, whether you're Afghan or, or, or Syrian or, 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 or Nigerian. But the others need to go through the asylum system. You don't have an automatic, because you don't have an automatic, you don't have visa liberalization. And once you arrive, you need to prove that you are in need of protection. But there is no right to have immediate recognition of your status. I mean, that's not in the convention. So having an asylum system is not a discrimination. The problem is the violence at Europe's borders. The problem is that many who go through the asylum system, it takes a very long time. And the third problem is even many who are rejected in the end will stay in Europe. And then the question is, what do you do? And then if you deny them the right to live a normal life, you create a big social problem. So that's why what we, my colleagues and I are arguing, and we met, I think we persuaded the German government, the new German government in the coalition treaty on migration and refugees, it is trying to say we want to reduce irregular migration without pushbacks through partnerships with third countries. That means we want to take people in an orderly way in larger numbers, but we want to discourage people from coming with smugglers across the sea. And some call this externalization, but I don't think externalization is a very good term because it's just cooperation. The question is, is it legal or is it illegal? Does it violate human dignity? Or does it respect human dignity? But stopping irregular migration is not, I think, uh, is not the problem. One last point, perhaps. It is very strange, the debate we have in the world at the moment, right? That Afghans who have to flee, if, if I'm an Afghan uh, activist and I need to leave the country, that the only countries in which Afghans can be safe now are in Europe. Or North America. No Afghan is fleeing to Malaysia or Indonesia or Japan or South Korea and they don't get a status in Pakistan or Iran. Um, so why is it 
that most of the world, including all of Asia, the 4 billion people who live in Asia, many of which China, Japan, North, South Korea, Malaysia, are not poor countries anymore. Don't take any refugees, any at all. While uh, Europe, Turkey, Canada, you know, a handful of countries are taking in all the refugees. And then you have Africa, where you have some countries, especially Uganda and, and Sudan now, but also uh, uh, you know, Ethiopia now, where, where there are also refugees, usually from neighboring countries. But why has the international system failed? Why has the UN failed to persuade any country in Asia to accept any refugees, even from another Asian country. I think that's also an issue, and that's something we need to work on. Because, of course, Europeans need to offer protection. And I, I'm in favor of bringing out more Afghans orderly, you know, having big relocation, bringing in people who need protection. But the system worldwide will only work if we manage to persuade more countries to take part. And there, we are completely failing. And this is actually going to increase. Uh, the number of refugees are going to increase with the climate change even. So that is going to be another challenge that the world has to overcome. And um, so maybe but we Can have... I say something on this? Sure, Can please. I say something on this? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And I'll tell you why. Climate change, like poverty, like wars, will lead to many people having to leave their homes. But to be a refugee, you need to cross the border. You know, otherwise you are internally displaced. And the number of people who've managed to cross borders in the world in the last few years has been tiny. You look at the UNHCR statistics. Between 2017 and 2020, the total number of that increase in refugees in four years, 2017 to 2020, in the world is only 700,000 more refugees. So that's less than 200,000 more refugees a year, of which the majority are children born in Turkey or Germany or Lebanon or, or you know, uh, Uganda. Children of refugees. They are not crossing a border. So there, every year, 300,000 children are born as, as refugee children. So what that means is that if things get really, really bad, you have massive poverty in Nigeria, 90 million people, absolute poverty. You have wars. You have climate change, you have pressures, people will not be able to leave and become refugees if we don't allow this. And most countries in the world are very, very good at closing their borders. Today, and that's what I say, in one week from Ukraine to Europe, more refugees arrived than in four years in the whole world. With one exception, Colombia or Venezuela, which Colombia accepted. So the lesson from this is we only have more refugees if we have more governments that allow it. Turkey allowed it. That's why it is the country with most refugees in the world. The EU now allows it. That's why it is now becoming uh, the continent with most refugees in the world. Um, Colombia allowed it. But it's up to politics. It's not That's really, because yeah. of... Yeah. It's not the pressure. If you That's want to stop... If you want to stop refugees, you can stop them by force. And I mean, okay, that's a bit unfair because it's a very small country, but there are no Syrian refugees in Israel and it has a border with Syria. Why? Why? Because there is a soldiers at the border. You also now, now it's very, I was just in Hatay recently. It's very hard for Syrians today to come to, to Turkey because the border is closed. So it's not a natural thing that people in need of protection become refugees. It's politics. That's true. And it's when when the countries make it even harder with the walls and fences and militarization, surveillance within the borders, it becomes even harder and even yes. more violent at the end. Um, I, I think our time is up. Uh, but um, if I have one more question, uh, if I have time for one more question, may I ask you uh, the EU-Turkey statement and um, the future prospects for this statement, because the statement has uh, concluded its five years in 2021, uh, but we still have uh, the Syrians, uh, Syrian refugees, they're not called refugees, but the Syrian population in Turkey under temporary protection. And uh, how do you think this issue is going to continue? And uh, 
what would be your offer in that is actually a big question, but uh, what would be your offer in uh, the second term of this uh, statement or how, uh, or the future of the statement? It is a big question and it is hugely important for, for Europe and of course for, for Turkey and this huge number of refugees. Um, and the reality is that since early 2020, I mean, since end of February 2020, which is now more than two years ago, uh, this statement is, is, is dead. It's not applied. Uh, mm -hmm. Greece, supported by the European Union, is carrying out pushbacks. There are no orderly returns from Greece to Turkey. It's just pushbacks, right? Turkey is not taking people in an orderly way, like the, the statement said. And Greece is not respecting refugee law. Like the statement says, I mean, the statement is very clear that there that international law applies. You know, it's just a press declaration, so it can't supersede international or European law. But what we see in reality is that this is being violated. And I think we get to a, a very interesting, a very interesting, again, counterintuitive for many points. A lot of people say that that the the, the, the alternative to this statement you know, a lot of people believe that if there would be no eu Turkey statement made in 2016, people would continue to, to flee to Europe. And my colleagues and myself, we argued from 2015 onwards, the alternative to an eu Turkey statement that works is not refugees coming to Europe. It's what we see now. It's violence. And unfortunately, that turned out to be true. Since the eu Turkey statement broke down, since there are no more returns to Turkey, the number who arrive in Greece has fallen because of the violence. So now the danger in the European Union is some are saying, oh, but this is great. We don't need to give Turkey any money. We have less people arriving. Nobody can blackmail us. It doesn't matter what Turkey does. You know, we just push them back. That is the worst of all worlds. It's bad for the EU because it breaks its law. It's bad for the people because they are pushed back. It's bad for Turkey because it reduces the support. And I think that that is why my colleagues and myself are arguing strongly in Ankara, in Brussels, in Berlin, in Paris. We need a new statement. We need, it is, it is fine to try to reduce the regular migration, but you also need to have resettlement and you need to have substantive financial support from the European Union for refugees in Turkey. And the idea that you, instead of a statement, you just have pushbacks, which is what we have today, is worse for everyone. So uh, to all the critics of the statement who have said in 2016, uh, we, we would have liked something else. Well, now for the last two years, we had something else. And it's worse, far worse. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it was really an honor to have you, uh, Gerard Knaus, with us. Uh, thank you for all your uh, interpretations, evaluations and uh, your comments. Uh, it was a very uh, good program on our side. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Um, thank you, our viewers, uh, for watching us. Uh, we would like to see you next week with a new topic. Um, goodbye. <laughs>